II of John Paul II. It has become a standard in many ways. It's become very helpful for people because they have one volume that they can open up to and it links them to scripture and magisterial documents. However, since Pope Francis revised the catechism on the death penalty, many people have been kind of questioning, well, what's the story with that? Can catechisms be revived? Actually, this catechism, 1992, has been revised twice now. We'll look at both those revisions. And then Tim and I also are going to bring forward our favorite catechism, the catechism that has the most appro uh yeah, approbation, the most papal approval, and that is the Catechism of the Council of Trent, a.k.a. Roman Catechism. And before we do that, we'll say our prayer. Sound good, Tim? Sounds right. excellent. Let's do, um, let's do uh, Latin, Our Father, and we'll get into it. In nomine Patris, et Fidei, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster. Quies in Chedis, sanctificator nomen tuum, advenient regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et demite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos demitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to. I want to. I want to say something right at the say beginning. Say it. Here. People are are going to think to themselves and say to themselves, Taylor, you just said this is our favorite catechism, as if th there's something wrong with this. Aren't you cherry picking? Aren't you guys cherry picking? No, we, we're not. Here's here's what a catechism is. Is as much as it's supposed to be a summary or a codification of the deposit of faith, tr scripture and tradition, you know, what's non-deniable in the faith. It is a summary of the codification of our faith. So to the lawyers out there, this is like the restatement of torts, right? It's not, it's mm -hmm. actually supposed to be, it's not the law of torts itself, it's the restatement. It's, it's very close to being a, an infallible body of everything we believe, but it's not infallible because it's not actually any new. It's not actually a magisterial document. This surprises people. Well, it's I think it's it's a magisterial document, but it's not infallible. This is not well, like it's not, a it's not part of the magisterium. It's the Roman it's because, catechism is. Well, the I no? mean the Roman catechism. No, what we this is what mm -hmm. I learned. I mean, according okay. to Father Dave Nix. Not a not a magisterial document, according to um, Denzinger slash Ott. This is these are the best guides to what is in and what is out. Um, but th that that's a little technical. That's actually a term of art, and that's just bound to confuse people anyway. But my my point is this: giving a definition for what a catechism is, and thus why. For one thing, there's only 1566 and 1992 in terms of the universal catechisms. There hadn't been a universal catechism until 1566. So, and neither one abrogates the other, right? They, they work together. There are two summaries of the faith that as these borderline um, document summary types, they have to work, they have to work together or else the faith is untrue, that, right? Well, they let me, let me throw some wrenches out, okay? I think we need to define Do magisterial because we will just say the magisterium. And it's true. These are not, you know, extraordinary pronouncements. This is not like, you know, the proclamation of the dogma of the, of the assumption or the immaculate conception or an ecumenical council, of course. But when you read, you know, say Pope Clement the 13th, 1761 uh, encyclical, in Domino in Dominico Agro. I mean, it's definitely the language being used here uh, in regarding the Roman Catechism. I mean, it gets special praise. It you know, oh yeah, to be used oh, yeah. by the priests and all that. So it's a teaching document, but it's not part of the extraordinary magisterium of the Church. That's what you're saying, right? Right. Because I guess, the extra I'm worried people are going to hear you say this. 
whenever you're talking to someone about Catholicism, you can't quote the Roman Catechism because it's not the magisterium. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. That's why lawyers will get this. This is not, um, it's like, um, you know, the model penal code or something. When you're looking, it's a restatement of, of uh, existing law. And it's because, see, most magisterial documents, the magisterial documents are actually adding something unique. Back up one second. People, Not adding. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, no. People all, people out there all think that guys like you and I just balk at the idea of the development of doctrine. No, doctrine legitimately develops. That's what the magisterium is there for, right? But doctrine sometimes illegitimately is attempted to be perverted, at least in the minds of some of the faithful, the way they read. Doctrine can never be go one iota, one degree out of 360 against a prior teaching. No. And this is really why we're doing this show today, because 1992 doesn't go against 1566 in any singular ways. But, well, yeah, but I mean, it does. Can the, get more the revision on the death penalty does. Well, but it goes against itself, too. I mean, that's, right. that's the, right? So that make use that example. Father Dave Nix chose that example because it shows what we're talking about precisely. It, 1992 is claiming to aggregate itself. I think Robert Genis pointed out something in the 1992 catechism that needed to be corrected, and they corrected it, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you're correct. Before. So... Let's before we get to the two revisions of the 1992 catechism, I want to go through the levels of authority in Ludwig Ott because we yes, were alluded yeah. to them, and, and I want everybody to be clear. And before I do that, I just want to set up how Catholicism understands sacred scripture and sacred tradition because there's a lot of people who are confused on this too. So, our Lord Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Logos. He comes to earth through the immaculate womb of the Virgin Mary. He assumes a true human nature, fully God, fully man, united in the hypostatic union. He chooses 12 apostles. One of them denies him. Another one is replaced, Matthias. Our Lord and those 12 men laid down what's called the deposit of faith. It's never changing it has the seven sacraments in it. It has the Trinity in it. It has Marian dogmas in it. It has everything that is true and right about divine revelation. It can be clarified over time, but it can never change. You can never take something out of it and put something else in. There's no sub in, sub outs. It is what it is. We, sacred tradition is that deposit. And we as Catholics have to submit to that deposit of faith 100%, not 99, and we can't add something to it and say, well, here's the eighth sacrament. That's the deposit of faith. Now, once you have all that, you have different levels of magisterial authority in the church. And I'm reading from the great work, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. This is by Ludwig Ott. He begins, it's on page nine, he begins with the grades of certainty. Okay, so there are certain things that we are absolutely certain about in the deposit of faith, and then there's other things that are not as certain. And he gives six levels of certainty. I'm going to run through the certainty right now. Okay, the highest is de fide, fides divina. He says the highest degree of certainty appertains to, to the immediately revealed truths. The belief due to them is based on the authority of God's revealing and if the church, through its teaching, vouches for the fact that a truth is contained in revelation. One's certainty is then also based on the authority of the infallible teaching authority of the church. If truths are defined by a solemn judgment of the faith, that is a definition, of the Pope or a general council. Okay, so that's de fide. So, for example, this would be Baptism is a sacrament. It's a hundred percent certain. Nobody can can read the sacred scriptures and say our Lord Jesus Christ didn't want people to be baptized. There's no debating, right? We're not talking about, you know, um, 
super far down minutia like and we can get to this like what is the form and matter of the sacrament of confirmation right you can't like pull out the gospels where christ lays that down wait till we get till the amazon synod they, yeah before exactly. you say we can't there's no debating maybe, maybe they'll try but yeah right, that's right. supposed to be <laughs> yeah okay so the Baptism second level real? is fides ecclesiastica Catholic truths or doctrines on which the infallible teaching authority of the church has finally decided are to be accepted with the faith which is based on the sole authority of the church. These truths are as infallibly certain as dogmas proper. Okay? So these have been, this would be, for example, um, homoousia, right? At the first ecumenical council, the church defined Christ as consubstantial with the Father. Right, you can derive yep. all of that from divine revelation, but the church defined it in this way, and we know it's infallible. You can't say, "Well, maybe that's wrong." It's on the books. Right. Third level, a teaching proximate to the faith, sententia fidei proxima, is a doctrine which is regarded by theologians generally as a truth of revelation, but which has not yet been fully promulgated as such by the church. Level three. We got six levels, so now we move on to level four. Number four, a teaching pertaining to the faith that is theologically certain, sententia ad fidem pertinence, is a doctrine on which the teaching authority of the church has not yet fully pronounced, but whose truth is guaranteed by its intrinsic connection with the doctrine of revelation. This is what we would call in the law subject matter jurisdiction, right? The church has might not have ruled over it, but it's got definite, clear subject matter jurisdiction over this area. We should expect it to be ruled on at some point in history. If challenged, yeah. Sure. Five or or unclarified, yeah. Five common teaching, sententia communis, is doctrine which in itself belongs to the field of free opinions, but which is ex which is accepted by theologians generally. Okay? This would be, it's not, it's not currently, but you could go back in time and say, you know, um, well, I don't, I know, I don't want to use that example. Let me, let me just, just through them, then we'll talk about it. Number six, theological opinions of lesser grades of certainty are called probable, more probable, and well-founded. Sententia probabilis, probabilior, bene fundata. These which are regarded as being in agreement with the, cons with the consciousness of faith of the church, which are called pious opinions. These, the least degree of certainty is possessed, is possessed by the tolerated opinion, which is only weakly founded, but which is tolerated by the church. All right. So those are the six six levels and as you were just mentioning before father dave nix when he he wrote the article that's really good actually it's called it's, excellent. it's an excellent article it's called what catholics are missing in the death penalty debate it was published uh last year last uh last august and uh, he also refers to these six levels by the way if you don't have this book Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma by Ludwig Ott. You're missing out. This thing is so clear. Because, uh, it's a yeah, lovely it's, book. It's I, I spent about an hour last night before bed just flipping through it and reading it. And and uh, I was again amazed by how good it is. So that's, you know, as Catholics, the two highest are those of divine revelation, which are absolutely uncontested. You don't even need an ecumenical council or a papal statement for number one, right? Jesus instituted mm -hmm. the Eucharist at the Last Supper and said, this is my body, this is the chalice of my blood. You, you don't need a Pope <laughs> to even come out and clarify that. It's just so obvious, right? And then the second is the one where the church, on her authority, defines dogma, right? And so that would be something like, you know, the extraordinary infallible uh, promulgation, like in 1950. And so this, you know, this raises the question, you know, these are grades of certainty, but they're not, 
he doesn't grade documents in these six. I think that's kind of the important distinction. You know, he's not saying, you know, first there's, you know, apostolic constitutions, and then there's, you know, encyclicals, and then there's motu proprios and all. He's not doing that, right? He's not he's not making a hierarchy of documents. He's talking about theological topics and subjects, doctrines, and the degree of certainty from level one down to level six, which is barely which tolerated in the church. Right. I'm trying to, what would be a tolerated opinion in the church? I'm trying to. Tolerated opinion would be a new topic on a papal encyclical, I believe. A brand new topic that's never been treated in 2,000 years it would be this is not. Um, I'm, I'm thinking loud. Well, no, I'm if it's in a papal it. encyclical, we've got it. I think it's going to get more certainty above. I think it's something more like, um, you know, there were there, there were early saints who, you know, tolerated delayed baptism. You know, like that was allowed back then, even though it's not the right way, but it's tolerated. Sure. But the reason I would guess that that's a, that's that's a, that's an easy example, but it's got to be. I mean, the, the point that I want people to take away from today's show is what is new in the church is not necessarily false but it's there's hold on hold on hold on you got to be precise because i would say heck if it's new it's false get it out no it can be there there are legitimate developments of doctrines no 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 see that's the difference development is different than new no new if i take an old grill and fix it up it's not a new grill it's a developed grill listen to me no new genuses. There are new species. So the movement of the development of doctrine is from the general, right, the very general to the very specific. So something take take Laudato Si. There, there's never been a, a a church document on like recycling, but there is stewardship, right, in the Book of Genesis. So. It's a, and I, I'm, I'm not, what I'm certain about what I'm saying here, I'm not certain it's at that low sixth level, um, I'm, but I'm, I have to work it out. Uh, the point is, there's the general doctrine of stewardship. It's real, it's there, it's been ruled on, but this new application of it, you know, there wasn't even something called recycling 100 years ago. So it's, it's necessarily new in terms of its specific ramifications, not its generic ramifications. The genus is there, but the species is new. So the church is going to have to, presumably, it's going to have to at some point say something about any of these questions once they begin to touch on faith and morals. So, I mean, yeah, that's, I, don't, that's, I don't know. I, I still want to, I don't know if I'd agree with the genus species element either. Everything... Doctrines are forms, they are specified, and all those doctrines specified are in the deposit of faith. It's just they're not, over time they get clarified by us, but it's not like anything specific was ever new in the deposit of faith. Well, but it's a clarification of a genus into its... No, but uh, doctrines aren't genus, doctrines are species. Sure. No, that's right, that's what I'm saying. But except literally, if see what I'm saying is there's a moratorium on something like I, I just it's it's incredibly actually abstract unless we use some example. So I'm using Laudato Si. It's it's newly well. Ruled let's use on. something it, that's more species, concrete, like infant baptism or something. But I mean, infant bat. I mean, that's that's fine. But just yeah, I, I'm I'm trying to get this out. When it's new, because it's very difficult. It's actually very difficult. Because I don't want to say Laudato sees it necessarily in the deposit. I'm not. I haven't. I haven't. Yeah. Except so like it doesn't more, apply to our analogy of the deposit of faith. Encyclicals are not necessarily in the deposit. Okay. To back up one degree of specificity. They wait. That's what I was saying. Uh, there's a moratorium on them until you see them appearing in more encyclicals that's literally what the church does is it waits and it's like okay there's a there are famous encyclicals that have same famous sections that that a lot of these guys the uh the encyclopedists ought type guys 
Denzinger type guys, have said Cassidy Kanubi, everyone agrees certain parts of that encyclical are in the deposit because, not necessarily because of Cassidy Kanubi, but because it's the first encyclical that dealt with these aspects that are in the deposit, right? So there is a moratorium on, and this is the beauty with the development of doctrine, the real development of doctrine is, yeah, we're waiting to see whether or not this specification of, uh, of uh, stewardship in Laudato Si is part of the deposit or whether or not any other popes eventually pick up on it. That's the test. It's only developed in time. If no other popes pick up on it, then at 2500 AD, they'll look back and they'll be like, this is private opinion. But it, it begs the question to try to make the call in real time. You see what I'm right? It, it yeah, begs the question. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> all that's super complicated. I don't know how to untangle it. I think it's it's healthier, especially when we're going to talk about catechisms, to say there is a deposit of faith. Things are in it, or they're not in it. And everything in the deposit of faith is specified from the very beginning. However, the church herself comes to define it and understand it over time. So it's not like saying there was no Trinity. Trinity was not in the apostolic faith. It certainly was in the apostolic deposit of faith, right? But the defining of it for us as the church subjectively came out over time. So like what I'm what I'm worried about is, you know, I did all this assumption of our of our lady apologetics and videos and tweets last week because it was August 15th. And I had Protestants and even some, you know, confused Catholics saying the Assumption of Mary was added to the Catholic faith in 1950. Because they see that dogma specified and proclaimed in 1950. But that's ridiculous because if you go to 1900 and ask every bishop on earth and the Pope, do you believe in the Assumption? Yes. You ask every Catholic when you pray the glorious mysteries, do you pray the fourth mystery on your decades? The Assumption of Our Lady, yes. You go to every Greek Orthodox in 1500 and say, do you believe Our Lady's body rotted in the ground? 100% of them say no. So there's this, cons there's this consensus and consistency way before 1950. And, of course. And specified, right? Our Lady's body was not corrupted. Our Lady's body is in heaven. Of course, but Boom. that was dogma. So that that's why, yeah, just, be, just because it gets dogma... Two doesn't mean there's anything at all N-E-W new. But dogma means you've gone from from level one to level two, if we're going from the top, um, or, or from two to one, right? When we're, we're talking about what people tend to argue about. I, I don't disagree with any of that. Um, what people tend to argue about are the lower level, is, the, is X topic, is X teaching which might just be a, a papal opinion is it part of even the low level magisterium in my experience that's what people are out there arguing about i remember the summer of 20 was that 2014 when laudato si came out i remember reading it being like this this doesn't have the feel of of being part of the magisterium and a lot of a lot of encyclicals aren't so yeah, I mean, something easy. See, I mean, this, this that's at a much more fundamental level, the question of, of Mary's assumption into heaven, because it's there in the Christian tradition, and it, it's so robustly. It's such an easy question against the Protestants. We're dealing with more minutiae of what I was going to ask you is, and I, I, you don't have to answer this because it's, it's very difficult to think about, but what I was going to say to you when you said, well, it's not that doctrine goes from the general to the specific it's that it eventually gets a definition in time think about this because this is all very actually difficult stuff folks i don't have a really good answer for it either but then if you say something is is open to the field of jurisdiction of the the you know the roman authority the magisterial authority but it's not yet been defined that's what a definition is is an enumeration of the things like essential elements and parts so there's some kind of mystery here as to how it can be it can be present right particularly the high level things like the assumption it can basically be present in all eras of christian practice 
and that then it goes from level two to level one. Boom. Um, I think the bigger issues are actually easier if people understand what I'm saying. But there's something mysterious about a kind of appearance of. I, I'm, I just I can only think of Laudato Si okay, at the much fringier level, level five, level six, uh, according to Ott. This has really never appeared before. That it doesn't mean that it eventually will be part of Papal Magisterium, but if other popes started picking up on recycling, I, I can't say it without chuckling, but <laughs> if they start picking up on this and then publishing on it, eventually, at some later point, you'd say, oh, this, this was the doctrine of whatever, stewardship, which was there all along. It really made its first appearance in Laudato Si, and then a bunch of other popes picked up on it in the modern world. That. I don't think that'll happen with that. I'm just, I, I, I think that would be, that would be fully valid. We're, I, I, I'm not afraid of that. I don't think that's modernism or anything like that. Yeah, see, maybe I come out a little different. I would say there is no evidence whatsoever in the apostolic de deposit of faith. Let, let's just say the moral obligation, because we're talking faith and morals, right? The moral obligation to recycle your trash. I, agree. I just don't. I just don't think it's in there at all. So, for me, it would, as I understand it, and and again, these these six levels are not ranking documents. They're they're ranking ideas, doctrines with regard to certainty. I would say with regard to that certainty, and I honestly think if you ask Pope Francis, he's not going to say the moral obligation of recycling is number one day fide or number two fides ecclesiastica. Of I think yeah. he's he's really probably going to say it's opinio tolerata, a tolerated opinion, or it may be bene fundata, well founded. But no one's I, I don't think anyone's gonna ratchet this up the ladder to like de fide, you know. No the Trinity, never. right? So I think I think we as Catholics said, can six. say, Yeah, the Pope wrote that and uh yeah, it's a tolerated opinion in the church. If you believe in the moral obligation of recycling, no one is going to excommunicate you or bar you from communion. And if you also don't, if you do or you don't, you're good. Yeah, right? that's how I brought it up. I said yeah. Laudato Si would be, I think, an example of six tolerated. And yeah. then if, other, if every pope from now until kingdom come picks up on it, uh, and and says yeah yeah boy Francis was onto something with you after recycle your trash. There's, there's like the, then, a call for the recycling up. crusade. Yeah, yeah. If there's a recycling crusade, take up crusade, the take up the red not. cross on your chest and go around the yeah. neighborhood picking up trash and recycling it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so, but see that's much less threatening. That just I don't think that'll happen. But if that happened, then whatever. That's much less threatening than let's say the death penalty thing right where, which yeah. is really well it's not a new it can't be called the development of doctrine this is father nix's point it can't be called the development of doctrine because it, it was it was specified very early on i mean the church actually has always loved the death penalty everyone knows tnt here says this it's yes. been it has been circumscribed and defined and redefined and redefined and it was always up until jp2 it was always like, yeah, this is this is a definite thing. It's it's good. It's yeah. chastening. Uh, it was not a big deal because no one was really against it before. But there are so many. It's it was specified, and yeah. now it's being specified more and more definitively and specifically from JP to a little bit Ratzinger, you know, Ratzinger Benedict to now Francis is specifying it opposite. This is actually the opposite of the development of doctrine. It's a perversion of doctrine. Right. Yeah, that's 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 kind of where we're we're at on that. I, th I think maybe we should jump into the catechisms, both of them. Yeah. Um, show topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Show topic. Now that we got all that out of the way, <laughs> six levels. And it's I, hard. No, I'll be it's honest. Hard. You know, I've this is something that I've looked at for a long time, and and I thought it'd be helpful to bring it in because we do have levels of certainty, and as things go on, there's more clarity on it. You know, like. I was reading last night Ludwig Ott on confirmation and just the debate in the first 1,200 years over confirmation 
is the full, is the matter the laying on of hands or the anointing with chrism? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which one is it, right? And then the East and the West have two different verbal forms for conferring the sacrament of confirmation. So it's, you know, it's not an obvious thing, like where our Lord says in Matthew 28, you know, go out in all the world baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Boom. There's not right. much more to right. say about that. Right? right. That's, that's level number one. Right. But when it comes to something like confirmation or the form of extreme unction or some of these things, you know, you start, you move down a little bit on the ladder. Now, the thing about the catechism, of the Catholic Church, I was shocked because when I came into the church, all of us were taught, here's a Bible, here's the 1992 catechism, you are good to go. In fact, I even heard, this is an error. I even heard Catholics say, you've got the Bible in your right hand, and then the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the CCC, 1992, is sacred tradition. We Catholics mm -hmm. believe in Scripture and tradition. Heard that. The Catechism is the tradition written down. So if yeah. you have those two things in your hand, the Bible, the Word of God, and the 1990, 1992 Catechism, you got it all. You're good. Put them, up, put them on your nightstand, and you're good to go. The problem is, is, I, when they put out the revision of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, they changed paragraph 2483. Right. 20, 2483 said, uh, defined lying, bearing false witness, as to speak or act against the truth in order to lead in into error someone who has the right to know the truth. I remember. Now, they changed it in the new edition of the catechism and they omitted who has the right to know the truth. Right. Right. That kind of shocked me. I was like, wow. Yeah. They went back and fixed, they got their eraser out and did a little, you know, erased mm -hmm. it, blew off the little rubber, you know, shavings that you get there. It's a good eraser noise, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it was 97 in which they did yeah. that. And it was brought That's to my, right. this is, you know, the internet wasn't fully kicking up until the last 10 years or so, like where you could just Google apologetics all the time. And you we go to each other and you'd have different catechisms and you'd be like, let me see yours. And, right. and depending if you had an, I have an old one. I tried to find it before the show and it, I can't find it because it's the old one. It's the original. Uh, maybe it's a collector's item. Because it has yeah. it has both the original section on lying and the original section on the death penalty. It's like an error card. Exactly, it's like an error baseball card in card. baseball. Um. So yeah, it was updated, and so that kind of raises the question: Well, the 1992 Catechism promulgated by John Paul II uh, can be fixed. What's up with that? That unsettled me. And then when Pope Francis, last year, 1988, he updated paragraph 2267. We remember the death that penalty. one well, too. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, what's up with that? What kind of a catechism is it if it changes, you know, over time? Because that means maybe, you know, when, uh, I don't know, after the Amazonian Senate or 10 years from now, the part about, you know, SSA acts are uh, disordered and contrary to nature. What if we just go in ahead and go and, and erase that? Where does it stop? Yeah, it's troublesome. It is. It is troubling. But it for OK, a couple things. One, it proves that beyond a shadow of a doubt. The catechism is not the deposit of faith. The catechism is the right. best singular synopsis of the deposit of faith we have. If it's been corrected once, that proves it's not the living, breathing deposit of faith uh, instantiated on earth before our very eyes. Yeah, it's not, it's not sacred it tradition with the T in your left hand walking down the street. No, it can't be. It's, has it been corrected once? Yep, there it is. Twice. I, I mean, it's it's yeah. funny with... <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know what the I don't know what the Syngenis thing is. He, his wasn't the lying, right? But as far I, as I know, I, those are the only two changings. Is the uh, 
the, yeah, uh, the the weird thing on that one is they the, the change with regard to lying, not to get into a whole thing, made it actually easier to lie, made it hard, it made it easier to violate the moral law. That's no, I think it made it harder. Or, made it harder. It, it, it re- no, it removed the language to those who have the right to know. Yeah, but that's which like, means if you so, say anything. So in the it first makes version, in the first version, you could say the right to know. So to use the classic, you know, college freshman philosophy 101 course, you're hiding a Jew in the attic. Right. And the Nazis right. ring the doorbell. The Nazi door. Good evening, yeah. you know, sir. Uh, do you have any Nazis in your home? And then you in the old Jew- version Jews. of the catechism, yeah. you could say, well, it is the right to know the truth. And you could say to yourself, Nazis don't have the right to know the truth, and so you lie to their face. Right. Right? That's the old you version. You get away with that. You yeah, the new version that. makes it harder because it takes away for those who have the right to know the truth. You you lost oh, your no, Nazi no. card. You took it in the opposite way. I meant, I meant logistically. I didn't I, – I meant logistically. It makes it, it, makes it uh, much easier. M- many more things will fall in the then category of lie now. So it, I'm not. Oh, I see what it, you mean. Not easier in order thing. for a person to lie. It makes things to be classified as lies by more, the definition of yeah, lie. Gotcha. Yeah. So I we're see. saying the same, the exact yeah, same I see. thing. I was like, how how are we going to deal with it? I was like, no, it, it makes yeah. it definitely. So the new makes catechism, it. the yeah, uh, the new version the of the of paragraph two four two four eight three. You you don't have your Nazi exception anymore. They took it out. No. Right. That's yeah. Which is much more Augustinian. Saint Augustine is more like that. A bigger a bigger portion of statements are lies now. Correct. Um, whereas before it wasn't a lie because you're telling someone was asking you like like Taylor just said that did not have the right to know whether they're there, so you could actually lie. It was more Aristotelian virtue ethics. The new catechism made it strict. The the had the rules on speech stricter. It made things more Kantian. They they, they it was a big decisive step toward Kant categorical imperative on lying that famous example Kant gives in his uh his moral treatment and it's yeah. like this is weird we just became way more Kantian and way less Aristotelian and we all know that that would be wrong to not hide an innocent person so it brings us back to the the catechism particularly the 92 catechism we want we wanted to make this point that the 1566 catechism which was codified in accordance with the council of trent three years afterwards really has never suffered this kind of all of this uh you know hand hand wringing um it's an important point yeah and in the catechism of the council of trent is named by the council it's right. it's draft right. it, there's four theologians that that helped produce it but it was the the, se- the senior redactor was St. Charles Borromeo, which is impressive to have that yes. guy on the on on the head of the board of it, and then it's promulgated by another saint, Pope Saint Pius V. So it's coming in as a heavyweight. As far as I know, it's never been revised. Maybe I can be corrected on that, but I don't think it I has. think the book stands. It is my favorite catechism because it is so clear. I find things in the 1992 catechism still to be fuzzy. That catechism sure. is so clear. And uh, it doesn't read like the 1992, which is bullet points with paragraph numbers. The Roman Catechism reads more like a um, a didactic instruction, right? Right. Par- uh, not just bullet points, but actual paragraphs brought together. I mean, it but, is bulleted with with topic points, but it's not structured we- like the 1992. So I just want to make this point, 1566, 1992. There are other little catech. What about the Baltimore Catechism? Those aren't universal catechisms. We only have two universal catechisms. And there. so here's what we're saying to the TNT audience out there and, and first-time watchers. Uh, they are different attempts at different moments in history to make a the best possible synopsis of the deposit of faith, scripture and tradition together like that. So there are different historical attempts. There have been two. So all the people out there that are tempted to say 1992 uh, uh, abrogates 
1566. No, 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 no. Can't no, this that. can't happen. They're just different attempts to give a summary of what is and always must be the Catholic, uh, the, the, the body of Catholic truth. You see the difference? They're yeah. both summary statements. Neither is like, neither is giving gloss to the other. The later is not giving gloss to the earlier uh, in a way of generic becoming specific. There might be some things that are honed in on. In 1992, that weren't honed in on 5066, but there are, there are also some things that were more relevant in 1566. Biggest point I have to make today than they are in 1992. It's not like 1992's catechism is more specific and always just because it's later. That exactly. is our postmodern, borderline modernist biased. I tell my students. Moderns, people in our day, are the most bigoted, biased people, prejudiced people ever. We think our day is good after the Enlightenment. It's yeah. bad. We think we're smart. We're dumber. But the, So the point is, 1566 was honing in on some things much more specifically than 1992. Why? Because of the way that the wheels of history turn. They were responding to the Protestant sort of arch heresy and, and many aspects of it, in, in, you know, including – the, the forms that, that need to be responded to in the Counter-Reformation, uh, you know, marriage between husband and wife, roles of the sexes, things like that were a much bigger deal at the time. And so it's not just that 1992 is carte blanche more specific on all issues. It is not. That's wrong. They're differing summaries at different times. They're both valid. They go together. Yeah. Now, what about, say, someone who would, this is your opinion, I, I don't know if we agree on it or not, who someone would say, well, it's not that they go together and they ride shotgun with each other on the Wells Fargo bank coach, but the Roman catechism is better. Well, I agree. That's what I think, too. Okay, but so you can, you're, you're, saying, allowed you're to do that. You're saying that 1992 rides shotgun to Roman catechism. Yeah, they're, you're I mean, not saying that they're they're arm in arm. Both are great. Use both. What what do you what what's your take no, on this? I would advise people. Look, I mean, 1992 is more specific in some really banal, boring areas. So I would say if you're in one of those zones of legislation adjudication uh, where 1992 is more specific, then you might want to consult it. Generally speaking, the issues. And this is a preference thing. Again, I said this at the beginning of the show. How are you guys preferring one to the other? Because it's not a, it's not a, a new magisterial document. It's just two different attempted summaries at two different times. I find the emphasis of 1566 to be more in line with, I think, it, um, they specified more of the, the big muscular issues that are ironically more relevant to 2019 than 1992 did. And there's, there are political reasons for that. But I find the Counter-Reformation was a time when they were dealing with the ultimate kind of arch heresy. They really cleaned house. They really, I mean, they had more talented people in the church then. It's kind of like saying, well, why do you like, if you picked an average political document from uh, in America from 1790, right. why do you say you'd like it more than now? Because their politicians were geniuses in the 1790. They were all polymyths. Like, all of them were... There's something in the water in the 13 colonies in 1790. We had geniuses. Now our politicians are, are mediocre, uh, elite, uh, non-natural aristoi scumbags. And so, yes, on average, I'd much rather listen to either party, federalist or anti-federalist, a late 18th century American politician than a 20th or 21st century one. Similarly, in the church, we had amazing heroes in the Counter-Reformation as you and I do a show on, you know, every other day or whatever, we don't have so many amazing heroes in the church now or in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. It's an average thing. Right. Yeah, it's interesting when you look at the Roman Catechism, this thing is sort of, it's a flower. The seed for the Roman Catechism is defined and promulgated in the Council of Trent. And the Roman Catechism is sort of the flower that grows out of the soil. And I think that the 1992 catechism was meant to be something like that. The problem with it is, and as we've talked about before, the Second Vatican Council has ambiguities in it. 
it does not follow the clear outline of the Council of Trent or any of the previous councils before where it says, if any man says Let the bread and wine remain after the consecration, anathema sit. Let him be anathema. If anyone says, let him be anathema. Like, it's very obvious when you read Trent what's in and what's out. You read right. the documents of Second Vatican Council, and they go on forever. These are long documents. Yeah, yeah. And they're not all that clear. So then after you have that episode in the church, you know, there's this idea, okay, well, we need a catechism because you got Hans Kung saying this. What, what is really the teaching on this? And so in a way, John Paul II does something noble when he tries to put it all together. That being said, it brings into itself, and this is my criticism of the 92 Catechism, it brings in with it the ambiguities. Totally. So, like, I, I, for example, when you read the Catechism on um, the death of unbaptized babies, or with the lying, or with the death penalty, you know, these are kind of really big issues in our time. And not everyone, the, the Catechism is supposed to clarify it, not everyone's so sure about what it's clarifying and what it's about. So right. in that sense, it it does not live up to the older sister of of the Roman Catechism, or when you read it, 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 there's not ambiguity in there. Not that I can think of. I mean, no, I can't say that I've read every single page of the Roman Catechism, but I think I've, I don't know, maybe I have. I've read a lot of it, and I'm never like hmm, question mark in the margin. No, because it's deriving it out of the soil of Trent. Absolutely. Trent called for it. Trent actually specifically called for it. Whereas Vatican II, I mean, I agree with 100% of that. Uh, Vatican II did not, uh, 92 Catechism is not specifically codified, called for by Vatican II. I'm, I'm 90% sure. I've looked it, into it like three times. Yeah, I, I can't, I don't want to say that because I could be wrong, but yeah. I, I, pretty I, pretty I can't, darn sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't, it seems to me that if that were the case, you know, it would say, and this council hereby calls for a catechism to be promulgated. Which Trent did. Trent definitely did, and it says at the top of the document it, that it, it is. It's yeah. in conformity, it's in concomitance with Trent. I've, I've asked several people, I've looked into it on my own, and everyone thinks, no, that the, 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 there's some document, uh, some documentary disclaimers that say in the 92 catechism this basically doesn't abrogate other catechetical documents which i, I presume they're they're talking also about trent or or things that are later than the 92 catechism in conformity therewith but it it, it yeah i don't think it says anything about these either, either way someone check me if that's wrong that's fine i've always been curious and everyone answers in the negative but yeah, I mean, the, so you can go to either as a handbook of what you need, and we're not saying don't go to the 90, 92 catechism. We're just saying for most issues that arise in the life of the Christian, yeah, 1566 is just much clearer, and it's not abrogated by 1992. I mean, that's kind of the basics, right? It's just, right. it's not, it's, it's still on point. It's the Roman catechism. That's the name of it. Yeah. Now, there's another catechism out there, Tim, called the Catechism of Pope Pius X. It's from 1908. It's a good little catechism. Now, I don't know why everybody ignores it, but have you ever seen it? You've seen the 1908 catechism? It, it was published by it. a pope. It's q and A. It's It's kind of like the Baltimore catechism. Is it, it's not universal. It's universal. Right? Really? Yeah. I mean, a pope gave it. I don't think he just said this is for but Italians. Give... Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you have it there? I'm looking for it right now. Catechism of Pius X. It's great. I love it. I've used it. I've cited it. Uh, it's, again, it's it's very easy. Like, this is like a kid's catechism, basically. It's short. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like the Baltimore cat, like, I don't know, 50 pages, you know, it's not long. And, um, well, I'm pulling it up here. It's 1908. And then a shortened version was published in 1930 
with mm-hmm. illustration. I'm wondering if that's the one that I've consulted. I don't know if I have the 1930 or the 1908. I got to look at it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good little catechism. And for some reason, it's kind of fallen off the face of the earth. Boy. Yeah, but, it has. I'm you know, if a pope puts out a catechism, I mean, I think it's good. But again, it 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 it's nowhere even close to the Roman catechism. You know, yeah. I, as as far as I know, official catechisms in the church in the last five hundred years, you got the Roman catechism, you got the Pius the Tenth catechism, and then you've got the nineteen ninety two JP two catechism. I think both of us. You know, the reason we want to do this show is, in this topic, there are people out there right now telling us that the 1992 replaces the older ones. Can't do that. That derives yeah. from the error that Vatican II replaces all the previous councils. Right. No, that's not how Catholicism works. No. Nope. Right? The, all the councils are currently in play. Now, each of the councils has c- canonical canon law. And, and disciplinary elements in them that do not apply today. So, you know, for example, some of the canons in Nicaea 1 don't apply today. Sure. So, you know, if you go and you can read those canons and they're, and they're good, but they aren't on the books in canon law right now, and that's fine. But the dogma, the faith, the morals of all the councils are in play. They stand right now. You can't overcome them. And this idea that we're in a modern age, in a new time, and we are so privileged in our time because we're so smart and so advanced and so much better than our forebears and these medieval people and these patristic people that we get to redefine what Catholicism is, is the heresy of modernism. It has to be condemned. If you believe that, you're not believing the Catholic faith. Now, folks, say it with us now. Disciplines in the church can change. Doctrines cannot. Disciplines can change. Doctrines cannot. This also means, because I get asked this question a lot. I'm, I know you do too. Can they change for the worse? Of course, of course. <laughs> of course I mean, yeah. they're alive. Have Have you been alive yeah. ever? <laughs> Any time after nineteen whatever, nineteen sixty five, nineteen seventy? Yes, they evidently, they self evidently can change for the worse. But, and that's not. That doesn't mean. The, the doctrine has changed. That's a discipline. It can change for the tacky or the gauche or the felt bannery, right? And and they did. <laughs> right. So obviously disciplines can change. The, the church does not fold up and sink into the ground like the fall of the House of Usher. That's not what happens if a discipline changes. That's what happens if a doctrine changes. And that's why we're not bugging out about disciplinary changes, even though they're tacky to have to suffer through the newer, tackier ones. But we would do that if a doctrine changed, and that's why when you're dealing with actual doctrines, people, it's Simon Says, right? Uh, People on the internet, on Twitter, do not understand that the Catholic Church is Simon Says, right? For a statement to be that highest level, a pope has to say, Simon Says, ex cathedra statement, right? Yeah. Only two two non non argued about non bandied about instances of this in two thousand years the third and fourth Marian dogma. If a pope just says, "Hey, you should recycle," even if it sounds like he's using language that's non opining, that's that's more absolute, if, unless he 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 puts it at one of these levels, you know, these higher levels uh, that that Ott was talking about of the six, unless he puts it there by using according Simon says language. That's why the game tricks every little kid who plays Simon Says for the first time. You're like, well, he said it, though. It's like, but it's Simon Says. He's got to say this for it yeah. to be at this level. Can people yeah. please Simon says, try to get this? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and on the disciplines, for example, Council of Nicaea, 325. It's on the books. We can't reject it. Canon 4 says, it is by all means proper that a bishop should be appointed by all the bishops of the province. But should this be difficult, either on account of urgent necessity or because of distance, there sh- at least should, they should at least meet together. And the suffrages of the absent bishops also being given and communicated in writing when the ordination should take place. That's no longer in the books, right? The Pope, the Pope appoints the bishops. So this is a disciplinary measure. 
it's a canonical measure and it can change and and the appointment of bishops has over 15 or 1700 years uh, modified and changed quite a bit so again the canons are great but they're not the canon 4 is not in play in, in 2019 the dogmatic clarification of 325 is most definitely in play you can't say well new councils trumped nicaea no that's heresy. people try to say it. they think that's development of doctrine it's but modern. you do have people say well i follow vatican II, not trent yeah it's well, crazy i've seen a lot of that lately yeah, yeah. you know you don't yeah but they just don't know that's what these people need to be educated right mm -hmm. like this is you that's literally how the protestants or it is secularists yeah. think that the church works like oh but we won this election they think papal they think <laughs> conclaves to elect popes are like pay, are like presidential elections every american four year presidential cycle you say well hey they won they're going to get the president's not a legislator but he's going to get a lot of stuff in for his side you know he has line item veto blah 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 we accept that, right? There's there's ebb and tide. When when one party wins, they're gonna get some of their way. That is not the Roman Catholic Church, people. Yeah. When you have a pope you like, or there's a pope in there that that liberals dislike, like Benedict the Sixteenth, it doesn't mean that you're going to suffer some sort of legislative setback in terms of the the new policies enacted by councils like the Congress or the Pope, like the President. That's not how it works that's thinking that way is the the product of a lack of education about what our church is our church is simon says in concordance with the idea that everything that's there now has always been there if less specified at the beginning but there cannot be a reversal of doctrine the church would in fact fold up and sink into the bowels of the earth like fall the house of usher in that case it yeah. you know ontologically yeah you know, one of the good good points made by uh, Father Dave Nix, we're referring again to his article, What Catholics Are Missing in the Death Penalty Debate. And of course, he talks about the death penalty. And he says, you know, when you look at the six levels, he says, where does death penalty fit? And he claims it fits in number one, highest level. Because let me remind everyone, the highest level is the highest degree of certainty appertains to the immediately revealed truths. The belief due to them is based on the authority of God revealing fides divina. And if the church, through its teaching, vouches for the fact that a truth is contained in Revelation. Well, the death penalty, as we've talked about before, is in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. The covenant with Noah. God says, if any man slays blood, let his blood be slain. And it's because of the dignity of man. Right? Right? Man's right. in the image of God. That's why when a man kills another man in homicide purposefully, he also receives that punishment. It's right there in Genesis, folks. And it's God talking. Not Noah, not Moses, not David. It's God. That's the covenant with Noah. And then Romans 13, which you and I, we have to recycle it like every two months. Romans 13, Paul lays it down. Christ himself says to Pilate, you could not put me to death unless you have the authority from above to do it so it's in the sacred scriptures it's divinely revealed that god not only allows it but commanded it that's level one right we're never going back we're never going Kids. back and then beyond that you know this goes on to say and if the church confirms it well the church has confirmed it I mean, there was death penalty in the in the in Vatican City, I believe, up until the 1960s, maybe as late as the 70s. I need to look that up. Hmm. You know, yeah. when I, I was there once, and uh, a, a priest who works in Vatican City pointed out to me where the guillotine used to be in Vatican City. He's like, right there is where the the guillotine used to be. They took it down. That that chapel. <laughs> yeah, no, uh -huh. it's not a chapel. It's out. It's out. I believe where he was pointing was outside. Maybe it's wrong, but he said, "Yeah, that's yeah. where that's where the guillotine was, and that's where people uh, were killed in the yeah. papal states." I mean, yeah, it, but this is what I meant about the assumptions of the the postmodern illiterate, which is 
such a high portion of the pot, the human population. Now we think we're so smart. Yeah. You know, in the post enlightenment eras, you know, whether there's one, two, three eras you count in post enlightenment centuries, we think we're so smart and we're not. We think that the medievals and the ancients were so dumb and they were smart. Things were so much clearer and we have so much prejudice that there is, wait for it, something called the heresy of modernism, the synthesis of all heresies, where we just, we think it's a good answer. I mean, you and I don't, but people out there think it's a good answer to go, well, yeah, I'm not saying that the Vatican City didn't have the death penalty all along, but that was the olden days, bro. Like a, like that <laughs> like that one Carl Jr. commercial, that, that was the olden days. It's like, that. that's my point. If anything, I, I was I was talking to my brother the other day and I said, like, look, it's not there's no chronological bias in the church, and um, meaning there's no chronological bias to the present. And he said, no, but there is. There's a chronological bias for the past. That's right. They were the ones closer to Jesus. They were the ones closer to the apostles. They were the ones who were given the deposit. We're the ones that are getting further away from it. Does the does uh, the telephone game, you know, you play in a kindergarten classroom. Does the message remain more pure at the beginning or at the end? Yeah. Like, boom, drop the mic. It's, yeah, I mean, it's a G.K. Chesterton has with. that great quote that tradition is the democracy of the dead. Beautiful. The dead yeah, still speak, one. you know? Yeah. And you can't yeah. exclude the dead from the conversation of dogma. Because if you do, you exclude the 12 apostles. Right. And Jesus. Well, our Lord's also. resurrected. Well, right. Okay. But his words during his life yes. recounted by the Gospels are like, you're. I mean, in many of these cases, you're actually getting around Jesus. Right. So to be a faithful Catholic, that the, the best way to understand it is a deposit of faith. Your rich uncle goes to the bank with a check for one million dollars and zero cents and deposits it in the bank. Right. And says... Don't ever take anything out. It stays there till the end of time. That could be kind of a bummer for you to have a million dollars there. But <laughs> you you can't over time say, well, it's going to be $999 or $1. It is what it is. It stays there. Right. And there's no interest. There's no usury on it. When when Christ, when the, apostle, when the last apostle died, St. John the Apostle, the deposit was in the bank. The bank is the church. When Christ returns, it is the exact same deposit. Right. That's right. No difference. It's the exact same deposit teaching. Now, we might come in with some magnifying glass and, and learn more about it and clarify it, but it does not grow. It does not shrink. We can't say... Yeah, those bills are no good anymore. We're going to replace them. We're going to make it Bitcoin. We're going to whatever. You know, it's it's like gold sitting there. Right. Maybe maybe dollars is the wrong wrong way. Maybe it's one hundred talents of gold. And when Christ yeah. comes back, it weighs exactly one hundred talents. That's it. That's good. And in the twenty first century, those same hundred talents of gold are. Um, applied in some different ways, not opposite ways, but it's like, yeah, I mean, there have to be, there has to be some kind of the magisterium doesn't have to weigh in on it, but there are moral applications in the life of the Christian that that do follow technology. I don't think road rage was a thing when you're riding camels right. from Beth Bethlehem to Nazareth, right? <laughs> so you, we we have to think about things like, oh, did I violate the Ten Commandments right. this week? But with rage, road rage was rage was a problem. But that's the point. That's yeah. the whole point. It's like rage was and rage is talked about. It's just a new it's a new instantiation of rage, but it's right. not it doesn't mean that the deposit has changed. And it it certainly doesn't mean like, oh, well that was the olden days. They needed the death penalty, but we we have televisions in our prisons or whatever <laughs> right. John Paul II's point was. I yeah. I still don't know what the what that that modernist bias even means like that was the olden days it's like but but i'm still a human being human right. nature doesn't change exactly yeah people people in 
in 1000 were tempted to look on nakedness and in 2019 they are too they just have iPhones now so it's more of a right. it's a different problem but it's still the same vice of lust it's still the same capital sin it's still the same problem and the solutions to it are still the same right the means of grace the life of virtue not fighting lust temptations but running away from them on and on and on i mean everything written by these you know alfonso Ligori would apply again to these current situations so all right we're bumping up against our time i know you got to run and get to school tim so uh let's let's close in a prayer before we do please uh like this video please subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed already and hit the bell that'll notify you when we do new shows uh, also support on patreon i'll send you some signed books if you do and um i think I, what am i forgetting i think the, oh pray the rosary always pray the rosary every day and uh, the rosary itself is a newer devotion 1200s but the mysteries go all the way back to guess what the deposit of faith you're just thinking about the deposit of faith while you pray the rosary why that's why it's so powerful and so awesome Okay. Again, read the Roman Catechism. Read the Roman Catechism. Buy the Roman clear. Catechism. Right. Okay, so everybody Google search Taylor Marshall Happy Meal. You're like, what? Taylor Marshall Happy Meal? I wrote a post, and it's called Dr. Taylor Marshall's Happy Meal, and these are the books that you need as a Catholic who loves tradition. I've got Latin Mass Missiles. i got the little, uh, little Office. i got Canon Law. I've got Bible translations. i got catechisms. Uh, this, which summa to get everything's on there uh, I'll put the link in the show notes when we're done but it's Taylor Marshall Happy Meal traditional Catholics you must own and the link to the best Roman Catechism is on that blog post alright let's pray Nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti Amen Ave Maria Gratia Plena Dominus Tecum Benedicta Tu in Morieribus et Benedictus Fructus Ventris Tu Jesus Sancta Maria, Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et utor mortis nostre. Amen. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Fidei, et Spiritus Sancti. Spiritu Sancti. Amen. All right, everybody, God bless you. Have a great day, uh, Queenship of Mary. So pray uh, pray the rosary special on this day, and maybe uh, add in five more decades or something. God bless.